Hello, my name is Father Tom Ryan and I direct the Paulist North American Office for Ecumenical and Interfaith Relations here in Washington DC at St. Paul's College. And I will be serving today as the moderator for a presentation by Dr. Peter Fan, who I'm delighted to have an opportunity to team up with in this session. Mm -hmm. Dr. Peter is one of the really accomplished scholars in the area of interreligious studies. He has taught at at least five universities, um, in Dallas, Texas, the University of Dallas, and at Union Theological, and at St. Norbert in mm -hmm. Wisconsin, college, yes. and at Catholic University in Washington. And since 2003, he has been a pillar in the interfaith uh, studies department at Georgetown University here in Washington. Uh, Dr. Fan's writings cover a vast range. Um, he has addressed the fields, for example, of patristics, the early church fathers and mothers. He's addressed the questions around eschatology or the last things. And he has particularly concentrated his attention, um, I would say in the last decade or so, mm -hmm. in the whole realm of interreligious dialogue to the point where he has edited a 20 volume series and is presently serving as editor for both Orbis and Paulus Press in multi-volume series. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where you fit all that <laughs> into a 24 hour Tell day us. and a seven day week, uh, Dr. Peter, yeah. but uh, you obviously are a busy man and we're glad to just have an opportunity oh. to Hear some of your reflections Bravo. on this important yeah. question of being interreligious yeah, today. Right. Thank you very much, first of all, for a forum, a roomy forum, for inviting me today to share some of my reflections on the question of being religious today in terms of the challenges both from society and from religions. And I am so happy to hear you, Tom. Uh, we knew each other through your work, of course. You have a wonderful book on interreligious prayer. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen this book, you should buy it and use it for mm -hmm. personal life as well. Uh, my topic today is, as I said, is the questions of being religious. And one of my fundamental convictions is that today, to be religious is to be interreligious. Uh, I have a little book called Being Religious Interreligiously. I don't want to use it as sort of advertising and so forth, but to show you that this is something that has been discussed widely among at least uh, Christian theologians. I would like to begin by uh, explaining what we mean by being religious as being inter religious. Uh, that is the imperative of our time. Why is it so? As in the second part, I will talk about the four ways in which people are being religious today in terms of inter-religious dialogue. And in the last part, I'd like to propose three models for inter-religious relations. Let's begin by the first question. Why is it imperative today to be interreligious? What are the challenges that bring us today to this point as being religious? Some days ago, I heard a lecture talking about the second axial age. You know, uh, Karl Jasper, the German philosopher, historian of religion, talks about the religions that emerges between the 5600 BCE uh, to the first year, first centuries AD, and he called this area called First Axial Age. By coincidences, major religions emerge is in East Asia, in the Middle East, and they all talk about this uh, search for the transcendent. Each religion emerged out of its own countries, mm -hmm. cultures, civilizations. So you have Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Chinese religion, and then you have Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So you talk about the first 
axial age. But recently, you talk about the second axial age. Uh, what marks the transition from the first axial age to the second axial age is religious pluralism. That is, that these religions now, which originally emerged as independent, each on its own, though there's certainly some sort of relationship among them, today they feel that to, they are because of globalization, because of the media, communication media, because of migration and many other uh, social, political events and factors, these religions are brought together in dialogue with one another so that one religion cannot simply function authentically, truly achieve its goal, its religious goal, without entering into dialogue with other religions. Now, this is what we call the second axial age. The age in which inter-religious dialogue is no longer a mere historical accident. We happen to be living in the same area, country, and so forth but become an imperative, a theological imperative. That is, it is something that is required from the religions itself. As I mentioned, there are many social factors. I'd like to point only out two of uh, these in order to show that it becomes such an urgency. Now, many of us, when you talk about inter-religious dialogue in the United States, we always pointed the tragic event of September 11, 2001. For the first time, American people woke up to this reality of religious pluralism. Uh, it's unfortunate they took that form of tragedy in order for people to be aware of that today, uh, in the word of the famous author Diana Eck, uh, America has become, the United States has become one of the most religiously plural, plural countries, so that now we are aware that in every city, even the most, uh, uh, the, the least cosmopolitan city, you have uh, religions, not only Christianity, Judaism, but also Islam, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and many other religions. That's part of the American religious landscape. Okay, that's the first one. The second element is, of course, globalization. Uh, through the means of communication, travels, people come back and forth all the time. Uh, today, it is not a matter of staying one place. Uh, just before the conversation, the director told me that he was uh, in Australia and it took him 35 hours from home to home. I mean, today you can move from one continent to another within a day or two and you are immersed again in a totally different context. The third element is the element of migration. Uh, a migration because of war, because of political situations. Uh, you are reminded of North Africa these days, how thousands by the thousands of migrants had to leave forcefully because of war and violence of persecutions or by economic opportunities. They look for a job, something yeah, for their life. And so migration put people again shoulder to shoulder. That's my neighbor. My neighbor is a Hindu. My neighbor is a Muslim. And so we live in this society created by not only by migration but also by uh, globalization. So that's the context that forces us today to enter into the other religious other as not someone far away in India or China or Turkey but right in my backyard, so to say, right next door, so that. The second question, given then uh, this situation in which we live, the world in which we live, the world of globalization of uh, inter-religious contacts, why then, how then do we enter into communion with the religious other as other. I propose the four ways. Um, in Asia, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, form a very small minority. 
two-thirds of humanity live in what we call Asia. And about 8-10% of them are Christians. The Catholic Church, uh, you know, the churches in different countries of Asia, get together and form what we call the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences, FABC for short. The FABC proposes four ways in which in Asia people of different faiths live together. Uh, if you look at Asia, perhaps this is the continent where religious pluralism is the fact of life. You just cannot live without, you know, meeting people of different faith all over your villages or your cities. The fourth way, the bishop says, well the fourth way is simply live together. This is the way, the common life. We share life together. Uh, how many times we heard neighbors, oh my neighbor is a Muslim, my neighbor is a Hindu, my neighbor is a Christian, and yet we have never problem. We live together all the time. The part of common life is, this is a necessity of life. Sharing life is the first thing we do as human beings. And even as you have in a village, you have a temple, you have a pagoda, you have a church, and so forth, you have a mosque, and people should be able to live together, common life. The second part is common work. We work together for the common good. Now, if you live in the country and you want to build up the economy, you build up social services, education, hospitals, you just can't work for yourself. Even the simple fact of digging a well, people get together and work, dig a well, or build a hospital or something. So work together for justice and peace is the way in which we religious people can come together and collaborate. You don't need to compete one another, one school versus another school, or one hospital against another hospital, because only together we can reach this common good. The third way is the way of theological exchange. Sometimes it is necessary that scholars come together and talk about a certain topic, and the first purpose is to remove misunderstanding. I mean, we misunderstand what Muslim teaches about, let's say, the jihad. When we Christians heard the word jihad, we imagine all kinds of things. When you talk to a Muslim, you say, they tell us something different, something that corrects our misunderstanding, our misperceptions, our prejudices, and vice versa. If a Muslim meet a Christian and ask about God, well, we could clarify that we do not worship three gods, but only one God. And that is a part of the conversation and theological dialogue. The fourth one is the most difficult, and yet it's the most enriching, the most transformative. And this is something that Tom has written in his book, Interreligious Sharing. This is much more difficult because of our boundaries, because of the fact that we have so many differences and we think that we cannot share with one another our religious spirit and spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. The Rumi Forum provides us with this opportunity in which we can come as Christian, as Muslim, as committed to my particular religious tradition and yet at the same time we can pray together as your book has illustrated. Mm -hmm. there are prayers that we can take from other religious tradition and pray together. It is this profound, personal, and communal sharing of the transformation, transformative experience of the divine, whatever you call it, whether God or Allah, still this is transformative. And my last part, where are the three models that I would like to propose to you and I would end for conversation? When we enter into relationship with one another, mm -hmm. when we try to be religious inter-religiously, I suggest three ways we do it. The first way is as a migrant. Many of us here are migrant. We come from Vietnam or Turkey or England, somewhere else. 
the migrant, either by force or by choice, find herself himself in a new situation. You are a foreigner in a land. You survive because you're able to adapt to the new situation. You learn a new language, get a new job, get to know people. So migration creates this necessity and at the same time this possibility of transforming yourself, opening yourself to the other cultures and so that you get transformed and enriched by the situation you live in. It. Now I came to the United States 36 years ago. America is totally new to me and yet by being a migrant learning how to live as a stranger, as someone who respect the democratic uh, traditions, the political traditions, the religious traditions of the United States, I am more than just a Vietnamese. Something new that has transformed me. And that's why I call I am an American Vietnamese or Vietnamese American. The second model is the model of a host and a guest. Mm. This is a little better for interreligious dialogue. I enter into another religion as a guest. Now you know the guest. Mm. The guest depends on the host. Mm. You bring a gift when you come into a house, but you don't force the host to take them or use them. It is the host prerogative mm. to use them or to put it away. I am just a host. I have to respect the customs of the host. I am the guest. I cannot come to a house and say, I like to change the furniture. Uh, I don't like your food. Let me do all these things for you. No, mm. I am a guest. I am at the hospitality of the host. Now, mm -hmm. eventually, I feel comfortable enough, I will invite you to come into my home and I in turn become the host and you are the guest. Host and guest is a dynamic relations of sharing the goods you have, the food, the drink and then the religious tradition you have. It's a relations of friends. It is only friends that you can share and eventually as a good friend, I can say, I really don't like your food, mm. <laughs> eventually, but you don't do that the first day. Mm -hmm. well, you can say, well, in my country, we add a little more spices here or spices there, mm -hmm. and then what comes out of that is based on the friendship. And the last part, I ended here, is the model of a pilgrim, a pilgrim, pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. You are not only a migrant into a new country, you are not only host and guest. Mm. A pilgrim is someone in search of the transcendent. Every religion has these places. Mm. We Catholics have places where Our Lady is supposed to appear, Lourdes, Fatima, or you go to the Holy Land. Uh, the tradition of pilgrim is mm. a very old ancient religious symbol. A pilgrim is someone who is willing to move, to go, any place, any time, in search of what is sacred. And so each religious tradition, whether you are Christian or Muslim or Buddhist, who don't even believe in the transcendent, who talk about transcendent, we are all pilgrim in this movement. We may start it from different places. But what makes the pilgrim is this readiness to abandon one's own home. Everything you have, everything you mm. possess, and move to a different place. What if today being religious mm. is being a pilgrim? And in that sense, we create a new way of being religious, which I call being religious inter-religiously. Uh, I'd like to end here so that there'll be more mm -hmm. questions, conversations. So basically, the first part I say, what are the political, social, economic situations that forces us, that challenges to be religious, interreligiously? Mm -hmm. In the second part, it talks about the four ways in which 
interreligious dialogue take place. And the last, in my final part, I propose three different models of being mm -hmm. interreligious as a migrant, as a host and guest, mm -hmm. and above all, as a pilgrim to the transcendent. Thank you very mm. much. And mm -hmm. open for questions. Mm -hmm. Tom, you may begin. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. That was rich. You put a lot out there for our reflection. Let me give you an opportunity just to uh, say a little more about how your own migrancy, your own pilgrimage, has been an enrichment for you. Yes. <coughs> uh, one uh, of the right. sayings that mm. is spinning around in my head is that of the great... Um, scholar of uh, world religions, Houston Smith. Bert Smith, yes. And one of the things that Houston Smith liked to say was, uh, I am a Christian, I have a uh, very rich cuisine in my own Christian faith tradition, and he would add, I take multivitamin supplements. <laughs> I say, okay. You know? That's a good idea. Well, I thought that's yeah. a wonderful metaphor, metaphor. an image, yes. uh, that you know we receive things from other mm -hmm religions, from other yeah. practices that do enrich our own faith, mm -hmm, understanding, right. and practice. And let me give you an opportunity just to witness Thank to how you. you have been enriched. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, <coughs> before I enter into this autobiographical reflection, let me point out a wonderful uh, statement. It becomes like aphorism. It comes from a Catholic theologian, Raymond Panica. Mm. Anyone who does interreligious dialogue mm. mu uh, certainly must have heard of his name. He was the son, uh, he was Spaniard, he was born in Spain. Uh, his mother is Spanish mm. and his father is Indian. And he became a Catholic priest after ordination. He went to India and he lived there almost over 30 years. Raymond Panaka died last year. Now, he said this. He said, I left Europe as a Buddhist, as a Christian. I found myself being a Buddhist. I become a Hindu. And then I came back as a Christian. That is the notion of pilgrim that I mentioned before. Mm. He never left anything behind. He, he was a Christian. He became a Buddhist. Mm. He found himself a Hindu and he came back as a Christian. He never mm. left anything behind. On the other words, mm. as you said it, you put vitamin D and A and mm. it transforms who you are. Your identity is not closed. Mm. Your identity is open-ended. Uh, who you made who you are, but it never remained as you are from mm. one state to another. Now, for myself, mm. uh, I am a Vietnamese. Mm. I was born in a Catholic family, and so we have this tradition of Roman Catholicism. Mm. And the Catholicism that went, came to Vietnam mm. in the 17th century was, we call it Ibero. Catholicism, that is from Spain and from Portugal. Mm. And then later on, the French people came in the middle of the 19th century, and so the Vietnamese Catholicism, which I inherit as live, is Spanish, Portuguese, and French Catholicism in Mexico. But in Vietnam, you never re are just a Catholic mm. because you are ancestors. Mm. Uh, were Buddhist or Confucian. My relatives, many relatives are Buddhist. Mm -hmm. And so, as I said, we grew up mm -hmm. to have this sort of multi-religious perspective. You never feel that you had to abandon one religion to become Christian and vice versa. Mm -hmm. It's part of being multiple religious belonging. Mm -hmm. But then I studied in England, I studied in uh, in, in Rome and very many other countries of Europe, and then finally came here as a refugee, mm. as a refugee <laughs> in 1975. <coughs> I had about half an hour to pick up what I wanted to carry with me. I had only one shirt, one pair, and one mm. pair of sandals. That's all I had. So, psychologically, sociologically, you came as a refugee, as a migrant as a forced migrant, so mm. as a refugee, for mm. political reasons. Mm. And then, 
you learn, as I said, learn the new food, new way, mm. new language, and so on. So that's way of being human and then being Christian uh, got transformed mm. by the situation in which I found myself. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Well, I relate very much to what you're saying because um, some of the ways that the multivitamin supplements have enriched my own life, mm -hmm. from Judaism, for example, yeah, right. when I encounter Orthodox Jews out in the park on Sunday with the family, just really taking a Sabbath day, mm -hmm. it asks me, to what extent do I right. really keep a day for just playing mm -hmm. and praying, mm -hmm. for right. just my relationship with God and enriching mm -hmm. my relationship right. with right. others? Right. With Muslims, when I see Muslims stopping to pray five times a day, right. it asks me how many times a day do I stop mm -hmm. and really connect with God. Mm -hmm. Or during the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. You know, I oh, think good. fasting is a practice that has been by and large lost mm -hmm. among Christians. And here is a whole religion mm -hmm. that takes fasting very seriously. Mm -hmm. So what are we missing here? <clears throat> and several years ago, for example, at the Barcelona Parliament uh, yeah, of World border. Religions. Mm -hmm. The Sikhs did a marvelous thing. Mm -hmm. In They were celebrating several anniversaries that year, <coughs> and they set up this big Gurudwara, and mm -hmm. they just put on two meals a day for mm -hmm. 6,000 participants oh, yeah. at the Parliament in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And they invited anyone Everyone. who wished mm -hmm. to come for a free lunch, mm -hmm. free supper. You take off your shoes, you right. go in and you'd sit in long lines, mm -hmm. knee to knee, shoulder mm -hmm. to shoulder. It might be a lama Bama. on one side, a bishop in the other. You mm -hmm. never knew with whom. Mm -hmm. But we had the best conversations there. And one of the things that kept surfacing was what we're talking about in the parliament, mm -hmm. these people are living. Are living. Yes, right. They are showing us what it looks like with feet on the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. They came in at their own expense. They said, this is how we want to celebrate our mm -hmm. anniversary yeah. in an act of service. Yeah. You know, it was powerful. Yeah. That, that reminds me of my experience uh, in New Delhi. Years ago, I was yeah. out there for a meeting. Yeah. And I was sharing a room with an imam from Nigeria. Now, I went to bed, you know, sleep and all that. And during the night, I heard noises. And, you know, being a new country, you worry about what happened. And then I saw this imam kneeling, turning towards Mecca on his prayer rock and prayed. And I said to myself, what an experience. So the next day he said, Peter, I asked him, what was he doing? I knew that. Well, I said, no, he said, Peter, do you think that if we Muslim pray five times a day, as you mm. mentioned, seriously, do we then turn around and steal from people, telling lies? And you just can't. If you live in that form of life five times a day and your life is regulated by this mm. deep devotion, you mm. just can't turn around as a businessman, mm. turn and steal money from other people and do yeah. shady deals. Right. And then when we left the airport in New Delhi, and we were all there in the bar drinking, waiting for the flight, and I turned my eye, I saw this man roll out the carpet and pray in the middle of the airport. Mm. That is a powerful reminder mm. of mm. what our religious life has to be. Mm. And in terms of religious sharing, I mean, you learn from them. And then mm. one more, uh, when I was also in New Delhi, and you mentioned the Sikh, mm -hmm. I went to the temple, Sikh temple, you took out. Uh, your food, your, you had to wash your feet and before you enter mm. the temple, and before you enter there's this meal. Mm. This meal forces us to think that socially we're all equal. We all sit there. Yeah. Whether you're kings mm. or priests or mm. bishops or powerful politicians, you share, you sit mm. on the ground. Yeah, that's mm. what you mentioned. Mm. I mean, equality Mm -hmm. there and new hospitality. So, as, so after that, um, I was made an honorary Sikh. I was given a bracelet and I was given the mm -hmm. turban. Um, mm -hmm. One of the professors, he was uh, Sikh, he said, mm -hmm. you would qualify. I said, sure. So, mm -hmm. I, I was made an honorary Sikh there. Mm -hmm. oh. Wonderful. Let's give our 
listeners here an opportunity to bring forth some questions that they may have or some examples of migrancy, pilgrimage, being host and guest. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Just by way of future aims, what do you see as uh, the next important step in regards to uh, interfaith and interrelation relationships uh, at a global s scale, mm. but in particular in the United States? What mm -hmm. still needs to happen? Mm -hmm. What are the milestones that haven't been achieved as yet? And possibly even on a grand scale, what, what is the ultimate aim? What, mm -hmm. what is the, mm -hmm. the grand goal in, in, in all of this from your perspective? Right. Thank you. Um, it's hard to have a crystal ball and say, okay, this will go on, uh, will up in the future. But I think for the moment, because of the particular political situation mm. the United States finds itself with the war in Afghanistan, part of it is still in Iraq, and now with North Africa and Libya in particular, I think the possibility of this renew suspicion of the religious order, in this case the Muslim order, is very high. And so the first thing is this mutual understanding, uh, to understand what the other believes, what the other uh, religious other is not just a pure uh, a reflection of mine mm. or a lower reflection of a copy of mine, but truly other. So I would say that uh, the greatest challenge of, of for the United States, or people in the United States, is to understand, truly understand the other, accept the other as other. Um, what is the ultimate goal, you, uh, you, uh, you ask? I have always asserted that the goal of inter-religious dialogue is not to arrive at some super-religion that somehow uh, cover all the rest. Uh, there is not a global religion that will make Islam into Christian or Christian and Muslims and so forth. So that's not a universal global mm -hmm. religion. I, I, I refuse this idea. I believe that each religion will remain distinct, mm -hmm. different in its otherness. What makes them one is not some kind of mm -hmm. uh, super religion that unite them. But this basically what I fall for. We live together, we work together, we share our faith, and above all, our mm -hmm. share our religious experiences. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question here. My name is uh, King Boynton, and I represent myself. Okay. <laughs> I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. When you commenced that, you had some uh, words that you said about the second axial age. age yeah. One thing you did not mention is that uh, another reason that's so necessary today, uh, when you said uh, globalization, mm -hmm. that word now includes the globalization of things like terrorism, mm -hmm. nuclear proliferation, right. mm -hmm and climate change. Right, right. And these are huge problems. Mm -hmm. They're not problems you can uh, solve with one man, mm -hmm. woman, company, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. country, mm -hmm. or religion. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you say it's necessary, mm -hmm. it's with a capital N. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's take one quick example, the war in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That has religions uh, right. warring mm -hmm. against each other. We have a certain Muslim faction mm -hmm. and the Christians and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. And the solution is in our country we have the Petraeus plan. Mm -hmm. Even though General Pet Pet Petraeus is uh, likely a genius at military tactics mm -hmm. and strategy, and the uh, president uh, supports the Petraeus plan. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. He has to, because there's no other plan. Mm -hmm. There is no plan B. But the right rel 
religious people coming together could come up with a plan B mm -hmm. that does not try to have a military mm -hmm. victory, mm -hmm. but a healing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from uh, your vast knowledge. Mm -hmm. How can we uh, work together uh, and change the uh, war over there mm -hmm. into a healing? Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that military uh, strategies, however brilliant it is, is never a solution. I, even politicians have acknowledged that. What then, then is the role of religion? Religion is not an alternative to politics or other economics. Religion is simply a part of this total solution, if you will, to any particular uh, 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 political, or, uh, sorry, to any uh, conflict. And so we have many ways, we call it uh, a conflict resolution that doesn't rely on weapons or bombs or any other. But religion do have uh, play where you see the roots of conflict is misunderstanding one religion dominate another religion uh, because it happened to be in majority hmm? uh, and it works both ways it works either on the Muslim part or the Christian part you know, it depends on the, the country and so when you start talking about not winning the war but the metaphor is one of reconciliation you start doing differently. For example, we have these so-called non-NGO. They are not political, they are not military, but they are inspired by the ideals of justice, equality, human rights, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agree with you, totally with you, that the Petraeus plan, even though it is, will not resolve the issues in Iraq or Afghanistan. Religions do have a role to play. I remember, to conclude here, I remember Hans Kung, the German theologian, uh, has wonderful saying, the, the three sayings of his, you know, there is no peace until there is peace among religions. Mm -hmm. So religion is part of the problem, but also said, also part of the solution. It's part of the problem, but also it's part of the solution. Whatever way you want to go, you know, what we can do. So, but there is no peace in religion unless there is this inter-religious dialogue. Peter, your presentation today. Yeah, he has another question. Oh, yes, we have well. a question yeah. here yet, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your presentation. My question is about interreligious relationship. Um, my experience has been, I lived half of my life in India and half of my life in Britain. Yes. That in, 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 in India, we live together and we share everything mm -hmm. with our neighbor of different faith mm -hmm. and ethnicity. Probably like that in Vietnam. Good not, yes. But what we do not do is never question and inquire about other faiths. Mm -hmm. When I came to England, everybody was talking about faith, but never lived together. Right. Go now on. my question is that the in a, in a very delicate situation, mm -hmm. we may have lived for m years together, but all of a sudden, if there are crises, mm -hmm. they will don't talk about what you did yesterday. They will say what you have done 500 years ago. Right. Uh -huh. Like uh, Bosnia is a Yes, the war of Kosovo, yeah. yeah, yeah. So how important it is mm -hmm. to address the issue of memory mm. and history. Yes, absolutely. Without that, it will not be possible. That's my first. Mm -hmm. yes. Second formulation of that comes to issues that we can discuss in inter-religious situation, where there's a multiple religions mm. involved, mm -hmm. we skip the real issues we try to be nice to each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we need to have a bilateral relationship 
because each one of us has a different starting point in history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We remember the other person, what the other person may not recognize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, Sikh and Muslims. If you go to Sikh memory, it starts from Mughal period. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you go to Muslims about Sikh, it mm -hmm. is in 1947. Right. right. Each right. one has a different starting point. point right. How to address this situation mm -hmm. into faith, into religious really start. Right. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Uh, wonderful <laughs> questions from my friend uh, who is now a fellow at Woodstock Theological Center. We had a conversation uh, before. Let me take the first question, the me memory thing. Uh, memory is collective, it's national, it's very long. You cannot just correct one memory of one person. You have the war in Kosovo, uh, the uh, conquest of Constantinople. You, you don't remember, you know, these things, uh, the, the Crusades. When you talk about these, there are certain ideas and you associate with them, violence and so forth. The first thing is recognize the evil we have done. Unless each party say, we did that, not just, the, I wasn't there, but my church, my religion, my culture did that. So recognition of the guilt I may not be there, but I benefit from these events. I may not be present during the Civil War, and, but I benefit from the slavery. So the first thing is to recognize our collective responsibility. The second is to bring the victims and the victimizers to a different place, not to 1453, not to, to the war, not when the Sikh and the uh, Muslims started, but allow them to be able to remember that, recognize the responsibility, and then move to a different place. Memory is not for, um, reconciliation is never forgetting, but you remember differently. And that's all. The, I give one simple example. How do we write history books? What kind of history book we teach in elementary school? What kind of event do you want? I mean, this applies across the board. Mm -hmm. The way men and women relate each other. The achievement. So that's where I started out very simple. How do we teach history? in the most <coughs> basic level. What are the textbook we use? What are the eventual, okay? The second point you want, you mentioned, I agree with you totally. That is, any dialogue that neglects differences, so bilateral, neglect differences lead to being nice. And being nice doesn't last too long. So we just don't go there just to be, you know, nice one another. Uh, I, I, I tell you a story in Sri Lanka, and may have the time. You know when there was uh, in Sri Lanka the so-called uh, tiger, the, the, the liberation. They destroy, they burn certain Catholic villages. And they brought them together to reconcile the two you burn my village, you burn my house, we cannot come there. Huh? And you oppress us, you don't recognize us, we are Hindus, we are not Buddhists and so forth. Huh? So two sides work together, and the first thing they did, they say, we are hungry. <laughs> we just walk a long way, and this is the time. And then when they, the first thing is, before we talk about we take sides, and who did what to whom, and who burned whose houses, Let's walk out, we are hungry, we sit down and eat. And out of that sharing of food, mm. form the basis for the other problem that eventually have to be discussed. But it can be fruitfully discussed, not with rancor, with vengeance and so forth, but with reconciliation because they have something in common. And interestingly, it was food. 
It was the mother, the woman who brought it food, and they are interested in the recipes and how you cook this and go that. And that started what I call the relation of host and guests. Mm. Not formally, but here they started out that out of this friendship that you have the reconciliation, you can remember differently. <coughs> Not forget, but remember and move to a different place. Mm. Yeah. Your reflections today have been both inspiration and challenge, mm. a real vitamin for thank us you. all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. For that.